Uh, and I, um, I will happily tell you the story of the orange on the Seder plate. This started in the early 1980s. I was a graduate student and I was asked by Schocken Books to edit a book called a book of articles, um, essays about women in Judaism. The book was called On Being a Jewish Feminist. And the idea was not to say, what does Judaism say about women, but to say, what do feminists say about Judaism? So shifting things a bit. During that time, as I was preparing this anthology and also in graduate school and doing all of that work, uh, I had a friend, I, I have a lot of family in, in Los Angeles. And I had a friend, it's actually a cousin of a cousin in LA, uh, whom I knew pretty well. And his brother was living in San Francisco and he was gay. And he was sending his brother in LA some horrible reports about young gay men dying of a terrible disease that nobody could understand. There was no name for it. And my friend in LA, the brother was telling me about this. I remember just that at some point there was something called Kaposi's sarcoma uh, that was identified. At any rate, it was a horrible time in part also because the president at the time, Ronald Reagan, refused to allocate funding to the uh, health uh, system, I, I, the CDC or the NIH to, to do investigate to see what could be done. And young gay men, young men were dying in San Francisco and all over the country. And at the same time, there were Christian preachers saying that this was a punishment from God for being gay. So that was the atmosphere. I, I my book came out in the fall of 1983. And a few months later, I gave a talk at Oberlin College. And there I heard about some students, lesbian students had put together a gay and lesbian Haggadah. Um, I could tell you more about that, but it was inspiring. And so that year on Pesach and my family Seder, I decided to put an orange on the Seder plate and have everybody at the Seder take a piece of the orange, make the bracha over fruit, eat the segment of orange and spit out the seeds of homophobia eat the orange out of identification with gay and lesbian Jews and non-Jews, people who were being marginalized in the Jewish community and in the society at large. So that's how it started. And that's what it was about. It was about solidarity with gay and lesbian Jews in the 1980s at a time when there was a real crisis, a terrible crisis, before we knew the term AIDS and before there was medication uh, to prevent and to treat and so forth. So that's how it started. And as you know, the story then evolved into something crazy that I was giving a lecture in Miami Beach and a man stood up and said, a woman belongs on the Bema like an orange on the Seder plate. And so people were starting to put an orange on the Seder plate out of solidarity with what women on the Bema or something like that. Even though women were on the Bema, women were being ordained rabbis at that point, reform, reconstructionist, conservative. So I didn't know why, why did that happen? But I was struck by the fact that they took my story and gave it to a man and they completely removed the issue of homophobia that the orange was supposed to be addressing. So I have to say, I started wondering, you know, how many of the texts that we read by the Rambam and Spinoza and Rabbi Kiva and so on, how many of them were put, taking were ideas from a woman put into the mouth or attributed to a man. So that's the irony of it. But anyway, yes, so David, it was lovely to, to get to know you and it's lovely to be with you tonight. Thank you, it's great to have you and thanks for enlightening us uh, about the real origins <coughs> of the orange on the Seder plate. Uh, and also, uh, it you said that was in what year, 1983? Um, yeah, yes, yeah, so it would have been in the spring of 84. That was the first Seder when I when I did that. Yeah. Well, a lot of water's gone under the bridge, but aren't we glad that our own movement has really begun to transcend some of our issues with homophobia and that we now in many places in our movement offer equal rights to people of all orientations? Yes, yes. And I would say it's not only a matter of trying to overcome homophobia, but it's also a matter of recognizing the enormous contributions 
gay and lesbian Jews have made, are making, and will make to the Jewish world, to Jewish culture, to Jewish thought, insights that we gain. And to recognize also that since the beginning of time, homoeroticism has been something quite normal that affects most people's lives. When men sit day after day in a yeshiva, of course there's a homoerotic energy and that's that's good. It's good for them to feel that. Uh, it, can, it can raise problems, of course, because it may be difficult to shift from the homoeroticism of the yeshiva to a homo or a heterosexual relationship with a woman. They may prefer to have a homosexual relationship with them, in which case we need to broaden uh, what we understand to be what is completely normal, broaden our society to understand that. So yes, I agree with you. There's a lot of work still to be done. So maybe next year we'll put a pomegranate on a Seder plate. <laughs> That's a good one. So thank you very much. So I'd like to shift and talk a little bit about the legacy of your father through your eyes. Um, one of my favorite statements of many that your father made was that we don't just need textbooks, we need text people. We need to learn from observing and learning from people that invest in us and that we observe and watch them. And you've had a very special vantage point for someone who was a very public, inspiring leader and teacher, and yet you have a very intimate and personal perspective on your father's work. And first, I wanted to invite you to share with us a little bit, some of your reminiscences, in particular in your father, in helping our country, not just Jewish people, but our country to challenge the norms of racism at a time when that wasn't always the safest or most popular thing to do. Yes. Yes, thank you. So I'll begin with the, the second part of your question and then go to the first part. I guess I would first want to emphasize that the United States is a democracy that actually became a democracy thanks to the civil rights movement. That is, one can't speak of America as a democracy when a huge number of the population, all the black Americans are not allowed to vote. That's not a democracy. So the civil rights movement actually made a great contribution, as you pointed out, to the country by helping the United States fulfill its mission and its goal and its being uh, as a democracy. So that's why that march in Selma was so important. It was a march to celebrate the Voting Rights Act and to say, yes, this country is now a democracy. What concerns all of us, of course, is that those voting rights are being challenged by state legislatures, even by the Supreme Court. So I'm, I'm worried, as many of us are, of course, about the preservation of American democracy for that and for several other reasons as well. My father also experienced the civil rights movement and his relationship with Dr. King, which was a close relationship, as an ecumenical movement. And I just want to, again, my father always wanted things to be put in historical context. My father was born in Warsaw and studied in Berlin beginning in 1927 when he was 20 years old. And he lived in Germany even after Hitler came to power. He went to Germany to do his PhD. And of course, in Nazi Germany, what did he experience? He experienced antisemitism, racist antisemitism. So he understood what it was. And he was deeply disturbed that people weren't speaking out no one said anything. And in addition, my father's professors at the universities, many of them became Nazis. That was something I used to hear about at the dinner table when my parents' friends were all refugee scholars, Jewish scholars from Europe, and they would talk about it. And you know, how could it be that this professor whom we studied with, whose work we admired so much, how could he have become a Nazi? was just, it was unthinkable. And they would say, you know, we, we couldn't believe Hitler would last. We thought a few months maybe, but how could the Germans with all of their culture and education, how could this be to have such a person? So there was a great deal of that. 
And in addition, there were Protestant theologians in Germany, and I've written a book about this, who said that the Old Testament should be removed from the Christian Bible because it's a Jewish book, and Nazis can't have a Jewish book in their Bible. They said Jesus wasn't Jewish, Jesus was a German, an Aryan, and so on. So when my father came to this country and Dr. King was drawing from the Hebrew prophets and from the book of Exodus and was so welcoming of rabbis, that was extraordinary for my father. And he, he felt very much that the civil rights movement was a religious movement and that young Jews who went to the South risking their lives, that they were inspired. And I think so too. I think we should remember that this was not so long after the Holocaust. Six million Jews were murdered. It's a terrible trauma. And these young people, 18, 20 years old, were going on freedom rides, were going to help register African-Americans to vote, and often were beaten, rabbis too. I think this was inspiring. I think it helped heal us as Jews. It changed how we felt about our Jewishness. It made us feel proud. I think that Dr. King was quoting from the prophet Amos. That's, that's our Bible. And that was what was the centerpiece of the civil rights movement. And my father was very much of a, as you say, a text person. That is, and he used to say, and my my daughter is commanded to revere me but what do i do to make myself worthy of her reverence and that's a lesson for parents what do we do to evoke in our children the reverence that we want them to feel how to inspire them and i would say my father first of all was a person of tremendous compassion and empathy, kindness, gentleness. He always listened in a very deep way with his heart, whatever the problem was. He, he would see a student, once I, I remember a student was getting a, a parking ticket in front of the seminary and my father felt sorry for the student and brought him some books as a gift. I mean, just little gestures my father would make when we would go to the grocery store and there was a clerk who was not in a good mood and my father tried to, to transform the mood. He reached out to people. He studied all the time, all the time, but he was also full of fun and playful and loved to play with me as a child something that he had not had the chance to do when he was a little boy because he was studying all the time. And now he had a chance to experience childhood and playfulness. So that's a little bit, a little taste. So um, how did he happen to get in contact with Dr. King? How, how did that partnership or that collaboration begin? Well, they met in January of 1963 at a conference in Chicago on religion and race. They each gave keynote lectures and that's where they met. And just instantly, uh, they, you know, they, there's the word, they bonded. I don't know another way to put it, another word for that, but they became very close and they started to give lectures together. Uh, a few months later, they lectured to a Jewish group about racism, about freeing Soviet Jews who were not, as you know, not allowed to practice Judaism in the Soviet Union. They talked about Israel. Uh, it was a wonderful relationship. They also both were very concerned about the war in Vietnam and over the years started to work on that issue as well. What could be done to bring an end to that war? Uh, and I just, I just wanna tell you something. Whenever I meet someone from the civil rights movement, people who knew my father, and I meet them often, and they invite me. They invited me to a reunion of civil rights leaders two years ago in California. I was, it was marvelous. And they invited me because they are grateful to my father to this day. And I want to say that something I think is very special. You know, this was 60 years ago. 
the civil rights movement, but the gratitude that they express tells us something. It tells us that the nonviolence of the civil rights movement meant that for months and months, the civil rights leaders and participants were trained, not just don't hit back if someone hits you, but rather trained to think differently, to be a different kind of person, to be a person of generosity and gratitude, of kindness and gentleness. And it comes through. They are amazing human beings. I think of Reverend C.T. Vivian, for example, and John Lewis, and Andrew Young, and Reverend Lawson, so many uh, whom I've had the privilege to meet, Reverend Shuttlesworth. They are extraordinary human beings. One thing that I notice in the comment, that beautiful comment you just made, which is not something I've read or heard that much, is that part of changing society, it sounds like, for those who set out to change society, was also a matter of refining their own soul and their own spirit and their own conduct maybe in Jewish terms, to master their own Yetzir Hara and maximize their Yetzir Tov. A little yes. later on, Jessica is going to ask you some questions about our current moment. It seems to me that today, when people want to create change in society, they're usually focusing on what's wrong with somebody else rather than how to uplift and transform themselves. Uh, maybe we... we we can all take a lesson from your father's way of starting with their own selves. Yes. Yes. Now, um, I, I want to go a little bit off the path to ask a, a related question about your dad's influence on you. The groundbreaking book for me, uh, when I kind of became a disciple of Abraham Joshua Heschel was in the 70s when I was at Camp Ramah and somebody gave me a copy of the Sabbath. And I started to read about Shabbat. And I grew up with Shabbat. We always had Friday night dinner. We went to synagogue. We spent Shabbat afternoon with my Yiddish grandmother. Uh, however, this was like a bolt of lightning for me to read that book. And it elevated and just created a sense of grandeur and beauty about the Shabbat. It made it cosmically significant. Uh, a, I, I really didn't know anything about Isaac Luria, but it, it, in a way, the way the Ari says that the pious acts of Jews can uplift, you know, the various spheres of the heavens, re reading uh, the Sabbath made me feel like a participant in something much, much bigger than myself. And what I wondered is, if you don't mind my asking, what was Shabbat like at your house growing mm -hmm. up? What are your memories of Shabbat? Sure. Well, thank you. Um... I think, you know, the first thing I want to mention is that there is a short essay by my father about Yom Kippur that I included in the book Moral Grandeur and Spiritual Audacity. It's just two pages in which he describes anticipation, the anticipation of Yom Kippur being even more powerful than the day itself. And I think sometimes we neglect that. We don't give ourselves anticipation. Uh, so when I was growing up, uh, <laughs> Friday was just a different day. Uh, my mother, who was a pianist and who played the piano every morning for many hours, uh, would shorten her playing to go to the stores. And I remember even as a little girl going with her in New York City, where I grew up, uh, go to the kosher butcher store where there was sawdust on the, on the floor, and then to the kosher bakery to pick up the challah and then we go home and my mother would cook. My mother did not like cooking particularly. Uh, and, uh, but nonetheless, <laughs> uh, we prepared, we prepared a nice Shabbat dinner. And what I liked was the rhythm of the day. That is, it starts out in a relatively calm way in the morning, but of course, in the fall months and winter months, when Shabbat begins earlier, it would become more intense. And my father would come home very early from his office at the seminary uh, and uh, get ready, um, bathe and dress and so on. And then in the few minutes before it was time to kindle the lights, 
there was a moment of, I don't know what to call it, but a kind of intensity in the kitchen. Was everything finished? Was the blech on the stove? Was the flame at the right place? Uh, had, did, had we made enough, had we boiled enough water for tea for the whole uh, period of Shabbat? And so a certain little bit of anxiety in the kitchen. Uh, and then, and then we would go into the dining room and kindle the lights. And then we would go into the living room. We lived on the eighth floor and the windows faced west over the Hudson River. We would sit there and watch the sunset. And that was a beautiful moment. We normally stayed at home. My father davened at home and we would go to the synagogue on Shabbat morning. My parents occasionally had guests, not that often. Occasionally we were invited. Uh, but of course the evening was very calm and uh, relaxed in, the, uh, in a gentle way. We had a lovely Shabbat dinner, the three of us. There was a lot of laughter and fun and conversation, a little bit of singing. Uh, and then in the morning, my father often left early to go to shul and my mother and I would come a little bit later. My father said that he, he was going to get us, he was joking, he would get a stiff neck from looking to see if, if we had arrived yet. Men and women sat separately at the synagogue at the seminary. And then we had lunch. My parents would take a nap Shabbat afternoon and I had to be quiet, which was very difficult. And then often when I was young, uh, Elie Wiesel lived a few blocks away in Riverside Drive. This is before he got married. And he would come over in the late afternoon and go for a walk with my father. And then they would have tea. Uh, sometimes my parents invited students for Shabbat afternoon tea. <clears throat> this was a high tea with um, cheese and crackers and coffee cake. And sometimes my mother would make what's called a Herrentort, which was a big European very complicated thing to make. And there would be students at the table and they would talk about their studies and where they came from. And then we, we would daven and make havdala. And then my father would go to his desk and my mother would go to the piano. So that was our, that was our Shabbat. But I have to tell you, I, I, I don't know how to convey to you fully the mood and the atmosphere. I would say that my father writes in the book on the Sabbath that on Shabbat, you don't light a fire in the, in the oven, but you also don't light the fire of controversy. So there were certain topics that were not discussed on Shabbat, controversial topics. We didn't talk about the Holocaust on Shabbat, for example. We did sometimes have visitors colleagues, sometimes Catholic, nuns, priests, who were coming for the very first time to a Jewish home, first time for a Shabbat. And that was also something very special because we could, I could tell, and I remember very vividly, that for them, it was something extraordinary to come to a Jewish home and to meet my father. And my father would make Kiddush and the Motsi, and they were participating. And you know, they were just, I, I could see there was a kind of awe and they must have been thinking, somehow it can't be that this person is not going to go to heaven because he's not Catholic. On the contrary, I think they were thinking, we have something, we Catholics have something to learn about God from a Jew. And for them, it was revelatory, extraordinary. I think nowadays it's different, it's more common, but then it was very new and special. That's very beautiful. Thank you for sharing those memories of your Shabbat. Um, one thing that this narrative made me wonder is you mentioned the profound betrayal of the Jewish students in Germany by not only the entire society, but by the professors they revered and studied with. And 
Germany considered itself to be the apotheosis of Western civilization, and yet it descended into the worst and darkest evil that had been known yet to that day. And yet somehow that experience of going to the light of Western learning in Germany, of being a student in Berlin, of witnessing the rise of Hitler, of seeing the betrayal of his professors and fellow students and having to flee everything across the ocean did not embitter your father. And indeed he became a, a leading figure for doing outreach to non-Jewish people at a time when he had every reason to turn away from that. Uh, did you ever discuss that with him or do you have any insight? You know, have you ever thought about that? What led him to take that approach when he had every reason to turn away? Yes. Well, thank you for that, David. I, I, I would say, first of all, my father would never, he said clearly, he would never go back to Germany. He would never go back to Poland. Uh, but he, he came from that experience saying, first, this should never happen again to anyone. He used to talk already uh, in the 50s, he talked about Auschwitz and Hiroshima. Not many Jews included Hiroshima. And I think in many ways, we can divide the 1960s between two paths in American Jewish life. The path of my father, this should never happen to anybody ever again. And the obligation that we have today is never to be indifferent to other people's suffering. That was my father's approach. On the other side was Mayor Kahana, who said, never again to the Jews, and we have to get weapons and arm ourselves and so on. Um, so these were two different responses, very different. And I think for us as Jews, we still stand at that crossroads. Do we feel now an obligation that no one should ever suffer the way we suffer? Or should we only worry about ourselves? That's the question we ask. So you're drawing a, a line from your father's example to questions that you pose yourself as a teacher and a leader today. And I wanted to ask you, what do you see as your father's legacy in your own work or your parents' legacy in your own work, what are some of the ways in which you feel very, very much uh, following or inspired by those examples and teachings? And also after talking about that a bit, also how do you differ? In, in what ways is your direction your own? And how does it differ from your father's work? Well, of course, I didn't have the opportunity that my father had to experience the extraordinary richness of Jewish life in Europe, in Poland, and in Germany, and elsewhere. Yeah. So um, my father's influence, well, I would say, first of all, that when I was growing up, I, I knew about I knew about European and especially German literature, French literature too, but in English, but not so much American. And I always felt I was a bit of a tourist in America. And I always thought I wanted to go to Howard Johnson because that was really America. And the life that I lived with my parents was very European and in, and in some ways a little bit medieval. I mean, um, women, there were no women professionals. It was never, I was never encouraged. I was told you should take chemistry in high school. It'll help you with your cooking. Uh, not by my parents, but by one of their friends and things like that. There was no idea that a woman would become a professor. It was unthinkable. Uh, so, but things have changed. My father did suggest to me one day that I should go to rabbinical school and become a rabbi. And I, I was so, I, was, I didn't think that would ever happen, ever be possible. And he said, well, I think things are changing. So he always supported me in that respect, including when I wanted a bat mitzvah, which was also unheard of at the time. 
um, in terms of my scholarship, I knew the name Abraham Geiger when I was growing up. And when I was a graduate student, I started studying his work. He was a historian in the 19th century and he was brilliant and his work was extraordinary and nobody had ever written a book about him. And no one had examined the context and, and his arguments and how they were received and his originality. So I wrote a book about him and I wish so much my father were alive and could read the book because I learned about Geiger from him. And then I, for, I don't know, I, I, I came to another project which was about Nazi, it was about Protestant theologians who supported Hitler. And uh, it was based on archival work where I discovered the existence of an anti-Semitic propaganda institute that was financed by the Protestant church. And I wrote a book about that. And to be honest with you, I, I uh, I'll, I'll never do, I don't want to do anything more about the Nazi period because it was so upsetting. Uh, and it made me also very angry, but I think in some sense it was a kind of um, cathartic experience because I lost family and I grew up with this and it was a way to, to address it. Uh, and then I, I've written about Jewish scholarship on Islam uh, and in terms of my father's influence, I'll give you a more direct thing. A couple of years ago, a group of eight scholars, all men, published a book called Hasidism, A New History, 850 pages. And I looked at that book and I reviewed it uh, rather controversially, I was very critical because it was a book that was missing precisely what my father always urged us to think about, which is what is the nature of Hasidic piety? What is the religiosity? What draws people? What is it to pray? What what do Hasidic Jews strive to be as human beings? What draws people today to Hasidism? They could instead be, let's say, modern Orthodox or anything else. What is it? What's the pull? And that's what the book does not address. It also doesn't talk about women in a way that I mean, yeah, makes no sense. Um, but I think that the importance of understanding religious experience is something my father always emphasized and I considered extremely important. And it's to me very unfortunate that most scholars in Jewish studies are so inattentive. So even when sociologists do demographic studies and they ask someone, how many times a year do you light Shabbat candles? And then they write down the number but it doesn't tell us anything about what it means to those people. Do, do they light the candles to decorate the table? Do they do it because it's a religious commandment? Does it mean something to them? Do they feel moved by the experience as I felt always growing up, transformed in that moment, spiritually, even physically, I felt different when I lit the candles. Those are the kinds of questions and that's what I want to understand. And I want to also bring to people, I want to say this is what Hasidism is about. Look at the greatness of what we Jews have produced, whether it's in Hasidism or in philosophy in so many fields. And yeah. <laughs> Thank you. You know, your, your critique as you're relating it of that book on Hasidism reminds me of a short story by Agnon that I studied in college with Professor Arnold Band uh, oh. called The Betrothed. Mm -hmm. And uh, in it, the, the protagonist is a biologist, a marine biologist uh, named Rechnitz, who is studying different kinds of coral in Israel. And, but what Rechnitz does is he goes down and he gets the samples and then he dries them out and he sticks them with pins on uh, a base and he analyzes the dead samples of the coral and he classifies them. But he's friends with the Yemenite diver that dives amongst the living coral in the reef and all the fish and all the beauty. Uh, and in the story, as I recall it, there's a sharp contrast between the the dry lifeless samples that Rechnitz pins to the page 
and the glorious beauty of the undersea life in the, in the living reef. And I believe that Professor Ban suggested some say that Agnon uh, may have been uh, making a critique of modern scholars of mysticism at that time, uh, especially the foremost scholar of mysticism at that time. <laughs> that was maybe a little polemic. So what you're saying about the book on Hasidism, it's like they're missing the entire point if the point is how is the human soul moved. Yes, yeah, exactly. And that's, that's a problem in the academy in general. But yes, absolutely. And that's a problem also with so many German Jewish scholars with their philological method. And so I, you, you look at the tiny, at the words, but you don't see the whole picture and you don't see the subjectivity and the human beings. Yeah, well, that's maybe great, now, thank you. It's great that you welcome. studied with Arnold Band. Yeah, yeah. That was a treat. Um, so is this emphasis that when we look at big issues or we look at philosophy that it's supposed to touch or shape or change us or motivate us in some way as humans, uh, is that something that you convey to your students, do you think? <sighs> I, if you don't I, mind me putting you on the spot. No, I, not at all. No, I, I actually think about this and I had a, I convened a workshop this morning on Zoom with a, a group, a small group of, of colleagues in Jewish studies. And one of the questions that I posed at the very beginning was, what is the takeaway? That is, what is the point? I have brilliant students at Dartmouth. They'll memorize everything, anything. They'll learn it all. I can give them a pile on the work on a course on, let's say, modern Jewish history at 350 students, and they were studying hard and they knew everything. But then I ask myself, I have students who come from all over the world. They're not just Americans and they're not just Jews. What does a student from China take back with her to China? Took a course in modern Jewish history. What's the message? What does she learn? Not, not all of those facts. And, and names and so on. But what, what do we want to convey? And I have to say, when it comes to that, there are many things, of course, but what I would like them to know more than anything is the emphasis on the heart, is the emphasis in Jewish texts and how to cultivate one's inner life what kind of a person one should become, what, what we should do with our lives, what's the mandate. Life is, my father said, not just a gift, but a mandate. What, what do I do to convey that to them? That's the most important thing. Give them some taste of, of, of a Hebrew text, of a story, I think that unknown story is great, by the way. I, I give them stories sometimes from Yudlamid Peretz. Uh, do you know Bunche Schweig? I, I, I try to speak to my students' hearts, not just their minds. And I want them to feel that there's something that has moved them from a Jewish source that they will keep in their heart as they go through their lives. And that's what's important to me. That's a very beautiful vision. Thank you. It's, it's very, very compelling. And it's a reminder, I suppose it's a reminder that scholarship is supposed to be for a reason and that wisdom is supposed to change us. Yes, yes. Humanity is about our, our humanness and how to be a human being in this world. And I think that, you know, there's a tendency, I find with my students, they pay a lot of attention to antisemitism, and that's important without question, and I write about that. But I, I also want them to see what Judaism has to offer the world in a positive way. Would you say that in this vision, your understanding of what Judaism has to offer the world, that the responsibility to cultivate our own souls, as you framed it, also demands of us engagement in the world around us. That is that we're, we're, we're not supposed to simply withdraw from the world completely and just be alone with our books, 
yet there's also a, a, a ma'asa, there's a, there, there's a call for action. I know that your father writes about the leap of action is even more important than the leap of faith. Uh, but it sounds like in your own way that you also believe in a leap of action, that it's not enough to only cultivate or refine our inner sensibilities. Uh, in some way, are those meant to be reflected in the society we live in and in the way we interact in that society? Yes, very much so. And so what do I take then as a student from a, a course in Jewish studies to the way I look at the world and how I interact with fellow students, fellow citizens? How do I shape what I choose as my career path uh, as my obligations, my moral obligations? So yeah, I agree with you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's, that's a really beautiful message and and it's encouraging. And, and for uh, someone who works in community, for a congregational rabbi, we're expected to share both. So it's encouraging to hear a distinguished scholar that honors the nexus between inner cultivation and outward engagement as well. And on that note, I'd like to invite Jessica Delera, our rising rabbinic student, to unmute and she has some, Jessica has questions for you around different dilemmas that are confronting her, but I'll let Jessica take the next piece of it. And thank you so much. This is really enlightening and, and inspiring too. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi Small. Um, hi, Dr. Heschel. Hi. Um, thank you for your words so far. This has been very thought provoking, um, really gives me a lot to take with me as I am heading out to summer camp. Uh, the reason I'm here in California is I'm on my way to Ramah Galim, uh, where I'll be this whole summer. Great. And one of the challenges that has been facing me, which I imagine that you have experienced this also um, as, as a leader on a college campus, is how to make space for people to ask questions and to look at viewpoints that maybe uh, vary and, and don't necessarily align with uh, what they might have been taught or instructed up to that point in a way that, that allows people to explore emotionally and intellectually, particularly um, around around Israel issues, particularly now in the wake of the, the Gaza conflict. Um, so my question for you is, is how do you approach these issues with your students and on your campus? And uh, do you have any advice for me as I'm going to be discussing uh, Jerusalem specifically and, and Israel generally with a wide age um, and, and sort of range of ideas with my campers? Yes, so uh, I think first of all, one of the things that I appreciated about my father was that he would read anything, listen to any ideas. I could bring up any issue. He would listen respectfully, but even if he, let's say liked a book or liked an idea, he always would say, well, what's next? What's, uh, what, what's, what's, what are the limitations of this book or this argument? How can we now think in new terms? What's the next, the next step? There was never sort of a conclusion and now we have everything and it's all wrapped up. So that's one thing. And that I think is what's characteristic of, of any intellectual. Uh, so being free to ask a question or make a point, yes. At the same time, think about the idea, think about the question or the discussion in critical terms. That's very important. Now. Uh, of course, we have a, a range of viewpoints. I have students and I tell them, you can ask me anything. You can say anything. I, first of all, I've heard everything, <laughs> but you can ask anything and we'll talk about it. And let me tell you, when they do raise something, can be very left-wing, very right-wing, you can tell them, okay, but there are also problems with that point. Let's think about it from the other side. Mm -hmm. So no one should have a kind of, final vision that this is it right. every every argument has another side another angle and that needs to be brought out yeah that's something i try to work on i in my past life was a public school teacher 
um, and on different issues, right? We didn't talk about Israel-Palestine very much in public school, but um, but I always encouraged my students to, to stay curious and always try to see, are there other perspectives and viewpoints um, that, you're, that you're missing out on that you could maybe investigate? Um, and I, I have found that that sometimes is challenging around Israel issues in the Jewish community where people feel so polarized. You know, the moment I open my mouth to say that I care at all about the human rights and welfare of the Palestinian people, you know, there's a certain swath who have already stopped listening. And, uh, you know, when I say I, that I do think the state of Israel has the right to exist, there's another swath of people who have stopped listening. So yeah, sort of what, um, how do you, how do you hold your ground and model for your students in that in that sort of humanistic, intellectually curious center? You know, I, 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 first of all, I just want to say that the polarization is worldwide. Yeah. Uh, and we're also living at the, I, I think, I feel as though we're living at the edge of a precipice that is two thirds of humanity lives under authoritarian dictatorship right now. There's also massive protests around the world, but just think of it, two thirds of the human beings on this planet live under dictatorship in an illiberal authoritarian regime. So uh, singling out one is in a sense missing the larger picture. To talk about Israel in negative terms, which people do, is a substitute for thinking about the whole picture and the bigger problem. There is a problem in this world. And um, to, to focus solely on Israel and make Israel the scapegoat, first of all, I have to say that a lot of the language uh, on both the left and the right reminds me of Christian theology in the way Israel is being uh, held up to certain standards. So that's a side issue. I have criticisms of Israel. I think what's going on in Sheikh Jarrah is wrong. It may be that, that, that Jews have the right to the property of these apartments where Palestinians are living legally, but morally, it is wrong to evict people from a home they've been living in for 70 years. That's just wrong. And that only creates enemies strategically. Yes. Where's the seichel? That's not seichel. So it's very aggressive and it's very inappropriate and it's wrong. And I, I, when I was in Israel once with my children, we went to the weekly demonstration at Sheikh Shara. I think that's, there's, there's no question about that. It is not for the good of Israel. It's not for the safety of Israel to be doing things like that. And it's led primarily by young, aggressive Mayor Kahana types from Brooklyn. And it's wrong. Gaza was terrible. It was horrible. It was heartbreaking and it made me angry. But I was also appalled. I was glued to Israeli television on my computer, appalled by the fighting within Israel, the attacks that Jews would attack an Arab on the street and beat him almost to death, and vice versa, that Arabs were attacking Jews and beating them almost to death on the streets in Israel. You know, this has been a problem that has been ignored for too long, and it needs to be talked about in a serious way, and it's not a matter of right or wrong. Yeah. Is it much much more complicated, but we still know what to do. And the truth is people have warned us for a long time that peace, we need to be making peace and not walk away from those peace efforts as we have in the last four years with the Trump administration, I'm sorry to say. And this is what happens. Now, at the same time, look what just miracle happened this week that we have a new coalition government that for the first time is including an Arab party. And it's a coalition that ranges from the right wing to the left wing. From, from merits to, the, to Naftali Bennett. That's amazing. And maybe something good is about to develop. I hope so. So <laughs> if people condemn, they're losing the possibility of thinking that there's still future. Things might happen in the future. I, I, my feeling is Israel, and in every possible field, Israel has produced extraordinary gifts to the world. We have driverless cars because of Amnon Shashua, professor of computer science at Hebrew University who invented the mobile eye. I think about Yom Adolengi and the food and the cooking and so on. It, whatever the field, in music, in art, in scholarship, in every field, Israel has been extraordinary. And I do think that the intelligence and the sophistication of Israel can in fact be mustered to figure out what to do to make peace with Palestinians. I think Palestinians ultimately need their own state. 
I think it makes perfect sense to me. And I don't understand why not, frankly. If we're talking about the only objection I've heard is security, the security isn't there right now. No, so that doesn't make sense to me. The question of Gaza is a question not just of Israel, but of Egypt. Egypt also controls Gaza and won't allow the Palestinians to come into Egypt. So this is also a regional issue. And when people single out Israel and ignore the larger Middle East context, and I have to say, I, I, I visited Beirut. I gave a lecture at the American University of Beirut two years ago. And I saw also there's a place that has no government. It's in terrible shape. But I also know that whichever side you're on, the right wing militias and the left wing militias, they all can be cruel, both sides. There is no right, wrong, black and white. One side is evil, one side is good. And people who think that way are terribly naive. But I want to just say one last thing, and that is that nowadays we tend to be uh, not making political arguments and analyses, but everybody's just getting upset and talking about their feelings. It's the era of affect, of emotion. And also, you know, I may have, a, I have a, an opinion, a viewpoint. I have frequently changed my mind in my life, frequently changed my mind. I am not my political opinion. I may have a viewpoint, but that's not me. That's my viewpoint. And instead we have people being attacked as if they themselves physically embody that viewpoint that I disagree with. So that person is a bad person. I should be exiled. I'll never speak to him again. What, what's wrong with us? Why are we so consumed with emotions these days, with rage, with, with narcissism, as well as fear and anxiety? All of that needs to be addressed. And this whole, at least in the United States, we need to calm down. We need we need, I think, our churches, synagogues, mosques, schools, public libraries, everybody who can needs to calm the country and make people feel less insecure, less anxious, and less angry. Because it's those kinds of negative emotions that allow dictators to come to power. And that worries me. So we all need to just relax and know we're all in this together, this human life, which is quite special and very, very brief. And we need to try to learn to get along. As Rodney King said, why can't we all just get along? Right, and when we're in that, that sort of fight or flight, us versus them mode, that, I mean, even you know the neuroscience shows very clearly that you, you cannot, get into nuance, you cannot get into perspective taking when, when you have this sense of, of like peril, imminent peril that sort of shuts <laughs> down all of those higher level, uh, you know, more nuanced brain functions. Exactly, um, yeah. <laughs> so, so my last question for you is, is um, what gives you hope and keeps you going in the work that you're doing at Dartmouth? Um, with your students in terms of Jewish life and, uh, and engaging in those kinds of conversations. I imagine that there have been, uh, you know, maybe incidents and conflicts among students and faculty, um, but, you know, what, what keeps you going and makes you think that we can find a path forward, even if it's a difficult situation right now? Well, <laughs> first of all, I have to say, my students are really fantastic. I, I like them enormously and I learn from them and I feel hopeful because of them. I feel more hopeful for my students, I guess, than from my colleagues sometimes, not all of course, but also what's great about being at a college is that every year there's a new crop of students, new thousand students arrive at Dartmouth every year and they're great. And there are also new, new faculty who come every year. Um, I gave a, a seminar this spring term with a colleague who is uh, from, from Lebanon in Middle East. She's the chair of Middle Eastern studies. And we, we talked about what it was like in the 19th century for Arabs and Jews to think about modernity. We talked about parallels between the Nachda, which is the Arab Renaissance and the Wissenschaft des Judentums, the this scholarly study of Judaism, the discovery of historicism and the development of Hebrew literature, same time that 
Arabic literature was emerging, the novel and poetry and so on. So uh, experiences like that with great students thinking in new, fresh terms, it's so stimulating to think in a new way. It's exciting and it's wonderful. The students were great. And so moments like that, those are fantastic experiences. And it gives me hope for the future and it gives me joy in my life. <sighs> Thank you. It's good to hear that, um, yeah, this, uh, this constant looking outward toward new people and ideas and experiences, I think, does everyone a lot of good, uh, regardless of, of our situations and what's going on in the world. So thank you for that message. And may I just say for the, the kids at camp who may have um, difficulties right now with Israel. I mean, I understand. And I also think that's one of the things that was wrong about Bibi Netanyahu, that he allied himself with Republicans. And Zionism is for everybody. It's left-wing, right-wing, religious, secular. It shouldn't be confined. Mm. And I also think it's important that we understand that Israel is essential in terms of anti-Semitism. That's that question. And second, that Israel has so much wonderful, so much goodness to give the world, and it is, and that mustn't be neglected. Mm -hmm. And yes, some of its politics, terrible. That will change. And let me say, I, we in the United States really shouldn't point the finger because our governments have also done some pretty awful things around the world. So who am I to, you know? Yeah, that's the message that I hope to take that, that you know, you can love Israel like your family and yes. love the things about it that are wonderful. Be critical of the things about it that you find less wonderful with the hope of making it better. That's always the viewpoint that I come with. That's right, I agree, thanks. I, I really appreciate this exchange between the two of you. And Jessica, as you're a rising leader and in this room tonight, you represent for sure the younger generation. Uh, it's really wonderful to hear a fresh voice, but also to hear Susanna, how, how you react and respond to those questions. That in itself is very encouraging. Jessica, if you don't mind, I know your primary job tonight was to ask questions of Dr. Okay. Heschel, but I wanna ask you a question as we're about to wrap up. The same question, two questions that you asked to Susanna, which is what grounds you in the middle of all this and what gives you hope? I know that you shared with me that there was a letter that was circulated by rabbinic students, including a few from JTS, although mainly not, uh, which was extremely critical and used some very hostile, and in my opinion, denigrating language, biased language about Israel that was very unfair. Uh, and I'm sure that's not the only thing that goes on. So how do you stay grounded in the middle of that? And what gives you hope and optimism? Yeah, um, I mean, certainly around Israel issues, um, for me, it's very important to keep my thoughts and feelings grounded in Jewish values. Um, and if something comes to me that I can understand and explain um, and, and engage in from a perspective of Jewish values than I do. And if something comes to me that uh, feels like it would ask me to turn my back on some of my most dearly held Jewish values, um, then I, I refuse to engage in that way. And um, sometimes that doesn't make me popular, right? Both I have quite, you know, friends, on, a wide, wide political range generally and specifically around Israel issues. Um, and so, you know, if I can frame something in terms of B'Tselem Elohim, in terms of, uh, you know, being that, that shining light on the hill, um, if I can frame something in terms of making the world a better place, in terms of ensuring, uh, <laughs> Dr. Heschel, I, I fall out on the, I mean, in terms of looking at, at the Shoah, um, I'm definitely in the never again means never again for anyone camp. 
Um, it's part of why, you know, I'm very interested in uh, immigration issues here in this country. Um, like, you know, I often come at that from that perspective that is so deeply grounded in Jewish values. And what gives me hope is um, I see there are more people with me in this center, sort of left-leaning center, than, uh, than I saw even a couple of years ago. I think there are more and more people who are realizing that this tremendous polarization and uh, you, I think you use the word siloing of saying like, this is what I think and my thoughts on this issue are complete and done and I have nothing else to learn and I'm just going to keep repeating what I already think. I do see that there are more people quietly and subtly coming a little bit back closer toward the center and saying, well, maybe that's not actually the way to get anything done. Even if we can't agree on what should be done, right? Um, I think people are, are realizing that you, you can't accomplish something in a complex and uh, you know, very multi-tentacled, uh, to use a Traif metaphor, uh, situation when you're locked into a viewpoint of, of simplicity and an unwillingness to, to listen and to continue learning, just like you said, Rabbi Heschel always encouraged you uh, to read everything, um, talk about, think about everything. You know, there's, I, I have read, as I'm preparing for camp, I have read viewpoints from much farther right and much farther left than I am, um, just because I think that it's important to know what people are thinking. And, and even if I deeply profoundly disagree with the conclusions that they come to, that it makes me a better and more responsive thinker and leader uh, to have made the effort to expose myself to these viewpoints, to try to understand where they're coming from so I can look for commonalities. Where do we agree? Um, and that deep love of Israel and of the Jewish people and of humankind made in the image of God, that usually is the, the foundation for talking to anybody about these issues. Thank you for that. And, you know, as, as I listen to you, I think about uh, the following, and that is that I think following what Susanna said before, people get confused about what it means to be passionate. Mm -hmm. And to be passionate does not have to mean being closed-minded. Yes. In mm -hmm. fact, if we go back to the legacy of Abraham Joshua Heschel, to be passionately curious, to be passionately humble, to be passionately human, and to be passionate about improving ourselves in our world around with others, yes. those require being open and listening as well as declaiming. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's a takeaway from tonight that I find very encouraging. I wanted to share two very short anecdotes uh, I'm going to ask myself the question, David, what makes you hope, helpful? Hopeful. <laughs> so David, I'm glad you asked that. Uh, what, two, two anecdotes that make me hopeful. One is uh, when the terrible attack on the Tree of Life synagogue in Pittsburgh happened, one of the first phone calls I received was from the mayor of Bloomfield, Connecticut, which is right next to West Hartford. And the mayor said, Rabbi, would you please come join us? We have a group of citizens, of communal leaders, of political leaders, and of faith leaders who are going to be on the front steps of town hall in Bloomfield to express solidarity and to be against hatred in all of its forms. Uh, and that was a, I'll never forget that evening. And then not that long after, after the death of Mr. Floyd, I learned that there was going to be another rally against racism on the front steps of the Bloomfield Town Hall. And I called the mayor and said, could I, I don't need to speak, but could I please stand near you? I just, the way you were there for me, I wanna be there for you. And she said, by all means, come on over. And then months later, this winter, we had an EDL Shabbat about building peace and understanding in communities. And we had a beautiful dialogue on a Friday night, Shabbat, Erev Shabbat after services between the mayor of West Hartford and the mayor of Bloomfield. 
And so it was a white Jewish woman and an African-American woman, two proud, strong women leaders of their communities talking together, interacting. And it made me very hopeful. And Suzanne, as you talked about your father's bonding with Dr. King and other leaders like John Lewis and the interpersonal connections that were formed, uh, that gives me hope because I think even though there are things in us that tend towards our Yetzer Hara and to look at people as alien others and as a threat, we also have the ability to encounter people that this might be my friend and, and, and to build on friendship and then friendship can create social change. And the other one is in, term, I, in terms of uh, young people in Israel, Jewish people in Israel. A few years ago at the Rabbinical Assembly Convention, I went to a workshop on Israel education. And we were talk, told about young people who get to college and hear all this terrible narrative about Israel. And if all they've heard is rah, rah, rah in, in Hebrew school, then they don't know what to believe anymore. So I came home from that and started offering a course in our teen program called Israel is Real. And part of it was in a supportive environment to share about some of the challenges in Israel, including some of the ones we talked about tonight. But also I realized that our kids cannot just be taught about the politics of Israel. They need to know about the food, the culture, the music, the geography. And so we created this and in that course was a, a, a wonderful video by uh, Hadag Hanachash, uh, which is a, a Israeli pop group for those who have not heard of them. And it's about what Susanna was telling us at the beginning of the night. It's about Yom Shishi. It's about getting ready for Sabbath. It's called Yom Shishi Higia. Friday is here and we're getting ready for the Sabbath. And uh, so I think that there's a path forward and I think our young people are prepared to think critically, but also to develop affinities when they're given the opportunity to do both. And I would say that tonight is a, was wonderful. It was evocative, stimulating, and for me, very encouraging. And on behalf of all of us, Suzanne, I wanna thank you so much for spending this evening with us all our people here. Jessica, thank you for your contribution tonight. I wanna to thank Tammy and all the leaders of the Adult Ed Committee for making this program possible and all the wonderful people who came here to share it with us. Susanna, any last thought or sentiment you'd like to share with us as we wrap up tonight? Um, I just wanna say that it was wonderful to be with you and also with Jessica and I thank you, Tammy. Uh, and I, I think that if there's, a, a motif of the evening, it would be Shabbat and to keep in mind what it's like to have Shabbat in Jerusalem. That's extraordinary and it's so precious. And I think it's our gift as Jews to the rest of the world. There are many people in the world now who are beginning to discover Shabbat. And that's, that's what we give. And I think that's where in Jerusalem where Shabbat is, reaches its peak most extraordinary moment. Thank you for inviting me. It was wonderful to be with you. Be well. You too. Thank you so much. And thanks to everyone. Lila Tell. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Heschel. We really appreciated you coming. Uh, just one more little uh, bit of housekeeping. We are coming to the end of June. We're just starting June, but by the end of June, we'll be at the end of our season for the Adult Education Committee, but we have four programs left. So please, please, please make sure you're looking at our calendar. Make sure you're looking at the e-blast. There's some great programs coming up. One with Debbie Friedman, one with um, West Bank, should we say, or should we go? One uh, with the history of culinary, um, the Jews and culinary history. And then how did the Bible become the Bible? So great programs coming up. This would be a hard one to follow after. It was a fabulous program. We all enjoyed it. Um, but we still have some stuff coming through for adult ed. So please, uh, please join us again. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. Oh. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Heschel. Bye. Thank you, Jessica. Oh. Good night, everyone. Thanks, Tammy. Good night.
Bye, Latov, everybody.